Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us this afternoon. I'm Emily Collins, Knowledge Exchange Manager at HDB and I'm joined by Andrew Gilman, uh, one of our new Strategic Farms and Nick Parsons, um, HDB's Head of Dairy Development. So we're here for the launch of Statfold Farm and to want, I want to start by just outlining a little bit of housekeeping. So all participants are muted and you can ask questions throughout the presentation using the box on the right hand side. All questions are anonymous and we'll an answer them as we go through. Also, if you're signed up to Dairy Pro, please enter your name, email and postcode to receive Dairy Pro points. So today we're going to cover an, an, an overview of Statfold Farm from Andrew, including the top performing areas and those that he'd like to improve and also look at his key performance indicators. And so we've also got Nick Parsons, who's going to talk about the, the KPI Express tool later on. So start off, thank you very much, Andrew, for joining us. If you want to just say really about a bit of a background to Statfold um, and how you've and how you've got to where you are at the moment. Yeah, okay. So um, yeah, hi everyone. Um, yes, yeah, so my name is Andrew Gilman, I'm farm at uh, Statfold Farm just outside of Tamworth in the Midlands. Um, I'm the third generation um, on, my, on my tenanted farm. Um, my great grandfather moved here in uh, 1900. Um, so the biggest change in the in the dairy operation came um, about 17 years ago, when uh, at that point we were milking um, 80 cows, um, and um, mastitis was pretty terrible, and we uh, entered into the uh, what was then the MDC mastitis study, and. Um, Basically, they they uh, emphasised what we already knew. We couldn't carry on going the way we were going, so we had the decision to either get out of dairy or invest in it and, and make a better job of it. So we, we took the latter decision, and so that's when we started expanding the herd. We're now up to, um, to 260 cows in milk, um, but um, the aim over the next 12 months is to get to 300. Um, we carve all year round. Um, all the milkers are housed um, three six five. Um, yeah, so that, that's a, a brief description of that. Thank you. And I guess that's that progression has led on to why you wanted to be a strategic dairy farm. So do you want to? Yeah, um, yeah. So um, yeah, I've wanted to become a strategic dairy farm. Um, I do enjoy the, the you know the process of uh, meet, meeting other farmers. Um, Getting other ideas, hearing other people's points of view. Um, yeah, always, I've, I've always got a lot from um, from uh, from that sort of thing through the groups I'm involved with. With because um, I'm um, an Arla Asda supplier, so we've got discussion groups that that, um, that I'm part of with that, and I've, I've always enjoyed that process. That's great. Yeah. So the, the strategic farm program, um, some people might have seen other strategic farms. Um, we're aiming to have three meetings a year with each host farmer and we're really showcasing some top performers and encouraging farmer to farmer learning. So so thank you for joining us. Um, so we'll see daisies. So we'll start with your farm team and, and the staff you've got involved in the farm. Okay. Yeah. So, um, yeah, uh, yeah. The picture there is uh, myself with my um, herdsman Andy. Um, Andy's just turned thirty this year. He's been working for me for um, eight years, um, gradually taking on uh, more and more responsibility of, of the running of the herd away from me as as, as my as my roles um, cha um, change within the business as well. Um, yeah, he's the, he's the, he is my uh, right hand man. Um, and what other staff? So then we've got um, Kieran, who is um, he's about 24. Um, so Kieran's been working um, here since he was um, 16, and he's doing a um, he's using us as a placement for an agricultural course at Rob Baston. Um, when he finished that, we we took him on full time, um, and so Kieran is sort of um, and his and his deputy. Um, and then we've got Nigel, um, who I suppose it, we've, we've always referred to him as our tractor driver. Um, Nigel started working for my dad um, when Nigel was 18. Um, so Nigel's in his mid-50s now. So he's, he's been with us a, a long time. 
um, and he he enjoys the the, the tractor side of the um, um, of, of the business. So um, and is is very um, is very competent, and I can just I, I just know that I can leave him to most things, and he he, he does an excellent job. That's great. And have you got a couple of others? Um, yes. Three um, times? Yeah. When we um, eight years ago, we went to three times a day milking. Um, so at that point, I took on two part-time um, um, self-employed guys who their their job is just to come in and um, do the evening shift of milking. Um, and um, yeah, it, it, that I find it, it that that works well. I'm not expecting any um, any of my full-time staff to have to do that um, the, to do that for milking. Um, it's uh, it, it, it works better that way. Great, thank you. So we'll move on to the cows, most importantly. Um, so do you want to tell us a bit, um, how many you've got at the moment, um, plus followers, and then we'll move yeah. on to a bit of breeding. Um, yeah, so um, currently got about uh, 260 going through the parlour, um, um, all together, including dries, 290, and then we've got uh, about 180, 180 young stock. Um, so, they are um, predominantly Holstein, um, but I do have some um, Swedish Reds um, and some pro, pro cross animals as well. Um, yeah, uh, we have, as we've expanded, um, we, we, we do breed our own replacements, but the replacements are that to replace cows leaving the herd. When we've expanded, um, we've always bought in and um and nearly nearly every time we've bought him we, we've bought from um from off the continent so uh, originally france and then we bought some from um the netherlands uh germany and then the last um the last 130 cows that i've bought in have come from uh, denmark and sweden and what's the reason for for bringing in those new genetics what are your breeding goals um well breeding goals are to Increase yields. Um, I've got to say that's really the one of the most important one, um, but not at the expense of, of milk solids. Um, so um, percentage of uh, um, kilos of uh, fat and protein are very important. Um, fertility is a is a main driver in bull selection, and we um, we're always looking to improve fertility. Um, but all, over the past four years, um, I've actively been selecting bulls which are zero or negative on stature, um, just because I'm a firm believer we cannot keep breeding cows bigger. There's, you know, um, my, my, my cubicles don't get any bigger, so I think my cows shouldn't either. <laughs> That's a good point. Uh, we've got a question. What are the reasons for going down the pro cross route? So I think you probably just explained. Um, yeah, it's. Um, I mean, they, the, 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 the guys, um, you know, promoting Procross have got some amazing statistics, um, and I'm just interested to see how they will how they will get on in my herd. Um, my best, um, my best cows um, and best heifers, they will be always bred to Holstein. But then the ones that sit just below that, um, I'm, try, I'm looking to pro-cross those. And then the, all the poor animals are um, served to beef. Okay, and I guess that aligns with your Arla milk contract. So you're optimizing yeah. that. Going yeah, forward. yeah, yeah, absolutely. And we, um, we've been genomically testing heifers uh, now for the past uh, uh, three years. Um, so it's try, really trying to fine tune the the breeding on the farm to, um, you know, as I've, I've said before that you know we've we've all got those cows that you know give you know fifteen thousand liters of milk. You never have to look at the feet. Um, no mastitis. You hardly even know they're there. They're getting calf. And just trying to get more of those cows and less of the you know um, my the eight thousand liter um, rubbish ones really. <laughs> Yeah, and and how do you go around AIing and heat detection? Who will do that? And um, so heat detection, we rely heavily rely on the um, heat time SCR and um, collars. 
with them and they, they've got the rumination on them as well um, so if that uh, if the computer tells us to serve a cow then yeah we, we, we serve that cow the three of us on the farm myself um, husband Andy and his assistant Kieran we, we're all trained in um, DIY AI so there's uh, there's always someone here who can serve cows that's great thank you and then you've got just the one one bull is that right um, yeah, we've just got the one Angus bull. Um, he's there to to clear up any heifers who we um, who we haven't been able to get in calf to um, um, to, to, to AI. Okay. So we'll move on to to young stock. Um, so here we uh, I remember on, when we were taking photos, it, we arrived at a good time. Um, yeah. Do you want to take us through kind of from the from the dry period? To carving and those protocols how that works for you okay so um yeah dry period um we look to um, drive drive cows uh, 42 days before carving although i realized dry period is probably more like uh, 50 days um that's because if if a cow's yield drops below um 20 liters and she's in calf and they're drying we, 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 we'll dry them off um We've been, um, I'm a big advocate of selective um, antibiotic at drying off. Um, only 10% of our cows get antibiotic at drying off. So cows are dried off, they're put in the, into a far off dry group. Um, in the summer, um, they are turned out to grass. Um, at, at the moment, they are, they're housed and fed um, ad lib straw with um, three kilos of a, of a, of a dry cow nut. Um, then three weeks prior to calving, they're then brought into the um, transition yard where we feed a full decab um, diet with, um, with protected choline. Um, we haven't got separate calving pens. Um, it's something that... Uh, the shed that they're in is um, it's, it's one of our old Victorian buildings. It's um, it, it's just not really um, as good as I'd like it to be. Um, we have got a new shed built, just waiting to uh, save up a bit of money to be able to kit it out with you know um, concrete panels, concrete floors, etc. So hoping to get the, um, the the transition cows moved into into a new shed um, in the next couple of months. Um, which I'm hoping will will make a difference. Um, the the diet, um, the tra the um, decaf diet they're on works really well um, with very few um, fresh carvers if carving issues. Um, don't get um, milk fever, um, metritis, retain placentas, um, only a small amount, and we've had um, we've had one um, LDA in the past two years. So it's the the, the 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 diet works well, and and I put the lack of um, carbon related issues um, and especially LDAs down to the protected choline in the um, um, in um, in the decaf diet. That's great. Um, so so once a cow's carved down, um, how how do you manage that, and what's the process? And we've got a question: um, How do you manage yonis at carving? Um, so uh, yeah, yonis. There is a level of yonis in the herd. Um, fortunately, we're only ever getting less. Um, so I think we're down to um, yeah. There's there's only about um, six cows now on on my on my yonis list. They don't um, enter the transition yard. Um, the that they, they aren't um, they aren't served to. Um, to, uh, to 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 dairy semen that they're, they're put to beef um, and really now we are looking to not actually um, serve them and let them to, to, to get to get them out of the herd um, eight months ago we bought a um, a pasteurizer for um, so we've started to pasteurize colostrum freeze it um, so uh, we, we, and we, te we test it. We test it as well with the um, with an optical refractometer. Um, we write the um, the uh, antibody score on the lid of the um, uh, um, of the uh, colostrum packs, um, and then we freeze them. So we, we look. Um, so in a cow calves, we can defrost a, a four liters of colostrum 
um, in around 15 minutes. And so, yeah, we look to get um, to get that colostrum into a calf as, um, as, as soon as possible. Fantastic. So here we've got a picture um, of your your calf pens. Um, so how how long would they be in here before moving? Yeah, so um, so they moved um, so they moved away from their their mothers uh, within the first 24 hours, um, and then we bring them into our calf shed. Well. It, it is a new calf shed, although it is uh, about 130 years old structure. Um, but we've, we've only recently put calves in there. Um, calves go into uh, these um, Solway recycling um, plastic pens. Really like them. They're very. They're. Um, they're, um, they're. They're. They don't cost a massive amount of money. The the calves are on a plastic pallet as well, and so we can dismantle them between calves and steam clean steam cleaned all services so that and also we can rest them as well so we've got more than we need so um, um yeah they're probably rested for two weeks um b between calves and so a calf can go into a into a, um, a clean pen um then we um once in um once in there we um we bucket feed with a milk replacing powder um so and we look to wean at uh, 10, 10 weeks old Ten weeks, and so where do you send any bull calves? So you, I, I know you're using sex semen. I think you mentioned yeah, that before. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, so we've um, we it, it's very pleasing just the um, that how few um, Holstein bull calves we get now. Um, with um, we we don't use any um, conventional dairy semen at all. Um, but we have found that the Holstein bull calf is replaced with the Angus heifer calf, um, so a very a very low value animal, which which not a lot of demand for. So now we're just looking to um, we, we've started using sexed Angus semen um, to try and reduce them uh, reduce those numbers still. But all beef calves um, they we we sell them at two weeks to um, via a buying group to uh, to to beef rearers. That's great. And and any vaccinations? What's your vaccination program? Uh, so so no and no calves get vaccinated. Um, pneumonia wise, it's not something that um, we we suffer from. Um, so the the buildings where the where the calf the, the calves are and, and always they have always been kept in the in, in the old um, Victorian buildings. Um, those buildings have got uh, tiled roofs um, with a very steep pitch on, and ventilation-wise, they're 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 brilliant, really. You've got air gaps between every tiles, and the pitch of the roof, because it's quite a sharp pitch, it creates a chimney effect. So, I mean, walking in those those buildings, even when you know you can have like you know 30 odd calves in there, there's very little smell. The air, the, you're aware that the air is very fresh. Um, and probably it's you know um, during the winter it is probably a bit too uh, well ventilated in there. But the calves have got um, um, jackets on them, and just the nature of the plastic pens, um, they, they, they we, we bed with straw daily, so they are able to nest in there to to to, to keep warm. That's great. And then we've got now a picture of your your new heifer rearing building. Um, yes. So, how many different pens have you got, and ages? Yeah. Um, so, um, as we've um, as we've expanded um, and got to got to the numbers where, um, we are now, that I knew that expansion would is was was going to create a lot more work. Um, but we we found that we spent most a lot of time on the farm. Or I, I call it messing about with young stock. And they were, they were kept in the older buildings. We were all, you know, having to get a heifer out to AI them was, you know, takes two people, a lot of chasing around, a lot of stress, um, feeding them, bedding them. It it was all it was all taking too long. So I decided to build, and also we were outgrowing those sheds. So um, thought it, as as well as the new um, cubicle shed, which we'll come on to in a bit. Um, we build this shed you can see now, which is a um, which takes weaned um, uh, ten-week-old weaned heifers at, at one end, 
and as they get older they move along the shed i think there's seven sections in there they move along the shed till they get to the end four bays which is where we have um, we, we put collars on them and then we're looking to uh, uh, to inseminate them and the, the new um, the all self-locking yolks um, heifers don't need to leave there for any reason we could tb test in there um, it's easy to feed easy to bed and they are then they're doing really well in there and you're looking to you said if you reduce your um, age at first calving this will almost pay for itself yeah. what's your aim there um yeah we um we have always um for for a, for a good while now been calving at um 24 months old it has if you look at, um our figure at the minute i think is 24.9 it has slipped we're aware that it slipped um put that down to um basically um 12 months ago with all the building work that was going on it was a very stressful time um things were pretty much all over the shop um and yeah our age at first carving has suffered because of that but the aim of the new shed is to get the average age at first carving um down to 22 months and if we if we can achieve that then that 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 pays for the for the new shed in no time and we've had a question are you performance monitoring so growth how often yes. are you weighing um yeah it's it's only something we've recently started um so we started about three months ago so we are way banding um heifers at um at weaning um six months and at uh, at 12 months old thank you so we'll move on to to a bit of cow health now um looking at, at lameness how do you find your lameness or mobility and what are you doing to him improve it um yeah um it's it's something that we've um in the past um in the past two months really really decided to to fo focus in on um i wouldn't say our lameness was really bad but we're just aware that the foot trimmer was putting a lot of blocks on cows we're getting a lot of um uh, the, one of our main um, reasons for lameness was solar ulcers and um, these ulcers were um, then becoming infected with um, with di uh, digital dermatitis. Um, so in um, so um, myself, Herzman, and Foot Trimmer, we've got our head together, and so we've increased the frequency of his visits now from um, monthly to fortnightly. Um, we we were we were um, Foot Trimming monthly. We were um, mobility scoring monthly. So now we are mo uh, mobility scoring twice monthly the day before the foot trimmer comes um, to select those cows um, for the foot trimmer. We, we're routinely trimming now at 80 days post calving as well as the pre-drying off um, trim, which, which that they were getting previously. Um, we've once a month, we'll, um, we'll have three days in a row of copper sulfate in the foot bath um, and then the rest of the time um, formalin um, and just and um, and just really you know have a focus to get uh, of trying to improve um, improve the lameness that's great a question how do you manage lame cows differently um, well it's I suppose we are all for now um, that when a cow goes from score one to score two, we are they are being presented to the foot trimmer, and we're finding that at that stage, it's just a it's just a bruise which can be trimmed out. Um, if a cow is looking to go for a, looking getting towards those score threes, um, then we move those cows into our um, twice a um, twice a day milk group. Um, there's only 40 cows in that group. They're through the parlour within half an hour, and so they are they aren't standing up um, for they aren't being made to stand up for as long as as the other the other cows are um, to to take take the pressure off their feet. That's great, thank you. Um, and I know you mentioned a little bit about mastitis and your improvements over the years. Do you, do you want yeah. to go into a bit more depth of how you've done that? And yeah. Yeah, I mean, mastitis was our it was was the the biggest issue on the farm. You know, um, so 17 years ago, I think we had a mastitis rate of um, probably about 80 percent. Um, it was pretty horrendous. I mean, I was we we're milking 80 cows at that point. Um, we we're milking 80 cows, and at any one time we could have like you know 
12 cows being milked in the dump bucket. It was just, it was awful. So we made the decision and um, so Rob Green from Nottingham was um, said that, you know, if we um, we should put cubicles in and he advised putting deep bed sand cubicles in. So we put the cows onto the deep bed sand cubicles, uh, mastitis um, dropped down and dramatically dropped to around the 25% mark, um, which it sort of hovered, hovered on that mark. And then it wasn't till um, actually when I was fortunate enough to go on a bit of a study tour to, um, to, to North America and um, looking around some units there, there was um, some, um, they, they, were, they were bedding on sand and I could see there was a guy there getting the cows out for uh, milking, uh, this, this Mexican guy, and he had a garden rake and he was raking the sand from the front to the back of the cubicle as he was doing it. And so I thought, well, why don't I try that? Got home, started doing that. And that is then when the mastitis dropped, um, dropped again to, I mean, it's, it, um, it's currently um, around um, between seven and 8%. Um, so yeah, mastitis is no longer, um, which obviously I'd still like to reduce it further, but but it's not. Um, it, it, it's not. I wouldn't consider it to be a, a major issue now on the farm. Yeah. And um, question: How do you store your sand, and how often do you apply more? Um, we just store sand outside, um, and we uh, uh, and we put um, fresh sand in on a Monday and a Friday. That's great, thank you. And I know you did say um, about your selective dry cow therapy yeah. um, and antibiotic use. Just remind us. Yeah, so um, yeah, only only ten percent of cows get um, antibiotic drying off. Um, so our sele selection criteria, I think, is any cow that's had a cell count over over two hundred within um, within the last six months of. Um, six months before drying off or any cow that's had a clinical case of mastitis in the six months prior to to drying off will get uh, will get antibiotic and, and and the beauty of that is um well one of the, um, one of the great things is just we get very little dump milk very little milk is thrown away that's great so we'll move on now to um, the farm infrastructure and investments so the last last few years you've been busy um, with milking herd accommodation, young stock housing and, and the yeah. wind turbine. Yeah. Um, so we've got a, a an aerial shot here. Do you tr try and talk us through? No, it'd be difficult. Um, if I'll be able to. Yeah, OK. So <laughs> if we look at the, um, the, the bottom of the picture, um, first, you've got the big range of Victorian farm buildings. Uh, they're quite a spectacle, um, say, all, all brick and tiled. Um, in there, um, we still we still rear a lot of young stock. The milking parlours contained um, we're within that range of buildings, and um, about yeah well, where where the cursor is now. Um, then, if you look to the right of those buildings, um, there they is the original um, cow shed. It was originally um, a cow shed with a straw shed ne next door. Um, there was a uh, 80 cows in there with a central feed trough. Um, Bedded, bedded either side with um, asbestos-clad walls. Um, yeah, ventilation was as bad, pretty as bad as it could be. Uh, conditions were, were were pretty atrocious. So we um, we took the straw out. We so we started uh, first of all we put 120 cubicles in there, um, and so we started to fill them. Then once we got to 120. We we're able to put a little extension onto onto that shed. It's if it's on the bottom of, the, of of that shed. You can just see a lighter colour in the roof sheets. That enabled us to get another 50 cubicles in there. Um, so then we worked to to filling them up. Um, you can see the the one earth bank lagoon um, out the back of there, which which we scrape into a channel, which goes in that lagoon. Um, we've just um, this spring dug another lagoon um, the other side of the of the lane to the farm um, because the lane separates our land in um, my land in two got 200 acres either side so we dug the lagoon the other side of the lane to um, to, to, to take take the extra slurry um, then um, then the top of the picture the long building is the new cubicle shed um, so 
it made the decision to expand so going from um, 200 cows to um, 200 cubicles to 300 cubicles in one go um, so I took a lot of advice um, from um, vets uh, consultants and came up with a design for a two row um, 104 cow shed um, fee um, with uh, feeding on the outside under a cantilevered roof this is this picture of the new shed um, head to head cubicles. Um, all, all my cubicles are head to head. And the reason why I went head to head with the new shed was that with having head to head, it means I could get rid of and uh, not have any cladding along the one wall. Um, because if it rains in, it rains in the passageway, it doesn't rain on the cubicle. Um, and so nice big, uh, big cubicles, um, going for a lot more lunging space with, with these new cubicles. Um, and um, Nice wide passageways, um, self-locking yokes, um, uh, cow brush, lots of water troughs, lots of um, uh, crossing points, um, and uh, and then where the cows feed is eight inches higher than where they're standing, and there's the um, resin on the floor, um, so it's a nice surface to the meat off. So just really a big effort just to try and get it as as um, as, as good as I could, really. But, and that's that, great. Yeah, the, the cows have been in there now um, about 14 months, and um, it's, it is working really well. Um, we're seeing improvements in fertility, which we um, can put down to, to that new building. Yeah, that that was one of the questions. Um, what's the performance like between the old shed and the new shed, and have you measured it? So, um, yeah, I suppose performance-wise, it's um, we can't really measure it because. Our fresh um, cow calves, she goes into the new shed because um, it's, it's our best facilities. And then they stay there until they are either PD positive or um, or they've just been in or, or having issues getting them in calf and they've been in there too long. That, that, then we'll move them out. So, they, yeah, we get more milk out of that shed, but they are our freshest, our freshest cows in there. Yeah. And... Um... You, someone said you have lighting there. Do you use this to optimise yield in any way? Yes. So, um, yeah, I've got um, LED lights in there. We've gone for um, did a lighting plan to um, to try and achieve 200 lux um, throughout the shed for um, a light, um, so we have the lights on um, and then um, eight hours darkness, uh, eight hours complete darkness, and it's um, yeah. Uh, we we did do LED lighting, um, not not that not the same lights as those, then, but yeah, LED lighting in in our existing sheds um, about five years ago, and um, we we did see um, well the, the main improvements we saw was just the how um, how much better the cows displayed bulling um, with 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 the with, with the brighter lights, um, but also it just creates a really nice working environment in there as well. So the the two row shed over over a three row shed was that more expensive? What was your investment? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, that that shed worked out all in at um, fifteen hundred pounds per cow space. Um, yes, it was more expensive being a two row shed than a three row shed. Um, but yeah, all the um, all the advice at the time was um, yeah, um, it, um, I'll get better performance from a two row shed. And that mostly down to extra feed space. Yeah, all the, yeah, uh, 100, um, 104 cows are in there, and 104 cows can feed at, at any one time. So fantastic! And we've got nice, nice cubicles here. And I think there was your little story. Um, did you design it and take it to someone? And um, yeah, so well, it would, it, it, it would. We designed it. Um, it. It had gone through planning, and actually, I held a. Uh, um, it was an AHDB meeting here on um, on cow signals, uh, and part of the meeting, I, I forget, I forget the guy's name who, who took the meeting, talking about um, cow accommodation and and how how he would build a shed, and it was just like, oh my god, please let let this, <laughs> please let this shed. I've just had planning permission for me these requirements. Fortunately, it did. So yeah, yeah, that was uh, that was a relief. That's fantastic. Was it Rob Rob Davis? Yes. Is that the Rob name? Davis, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, so here we've got your your older um 
cubicle shed. Um, yeah. How many how many cubicles did you say you have in here? So in that shed, there's uh, two two hundred cubicles. Um, all all of them um, deep uh, deep bed sand. Um, that they are um, three row. Well, uh, there's there's two groups in there. One group it's a three row shed, and the other the other group is five rows, but there is a feed trough so they can feed either side of it. And you've got raised troughs there. Yeah, yeah. The the, the troughs are raised um, um, six six to eight inches off the floor. And and in those troughs, we just put the um, pile of wall cladding in the bottom, the the smooth plastic um, wall cladding in the bottom. Um, yeah. Let's move down. Um, oh, we did have a a question about how do you get the slurry over the road? Or um, so slurry over the road. Um, we we have got a pipe um, under under the lane, um, and. I have the contractor come every um, to, in winter, every couple of months, and he has a day's pumping from out, out from one lagoon into the other. Thank you. So yeah, we've already sort of covered this. This is a bit of a bigger picture of the the new heifer building, um, yeah. and the other side. Do you say that will be your new yeah carving? yeah so, so the other side is um will have um hopefully in the next two months we we will get that um, kitted out so it will look very much like the the um the, the one you're looking at now but in the last four bays we it will be for um tra transition cows um and they'll, they'll, they'll carve in there. Thank you. Uh, we've just got a a bigger picture here. Um. A comment um with low levels of disease post carving what's your first serve conception rate at first serve conception rate um it's not if i can find it um no i'm gone it's um I think it's around the twenty percent. I think, um, yeah, it's, it's it's not it's not as high as it as, as it should be. Um, you know, fertility is is a is 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 my is my biggest bugbear. It's my it's what go, you know all our attention's go, going on at the moment. Um, I'm hoping that the new transition cow shed should um, help cows get off to a better start and then hopefully improve that um that that, that first service conception rate um but we do start um we we, we start um the the uh, we look to um start inseminating at 42 days so it is it is it's quite early yeah sure uh, i think i know um our our kpi tool would use the the 50 day voluntary mm. voluntary waiting period Thank you. Uh, so moving on to the parlour, yeah. uh, talk us through what yeah, you've got. Yeah, so um, so yeah, the, the parlour it's in the um, it, it's it's in the um, old buildings. Um, not not ideal um, by any stretch of the imagination. Um, originally, it was a um, a ten twenty um, herringbone um, with jars. Um, then that was changed to 1020 direct line, and then it was updated again about uh, 10 years ago to uh, uh, 2020, um, and we, we we installed an ADF at that at that point. Um, it is it is tired, and that the parlour is. Um, it's um, yeah, I'm not. Um, I'm not I'm really proud of it, yet, but it's it does a job reasonably quick it's, it's a one-man parlor but in the next five years i would like to, to to construct a new parlor and what would you be looking for what would be your ideal um i'd i'd always like to keep it a um a one-man parlor um and so i'd probably uh, not set in stone but i'd probably look to go to a 2040 rapid exit with uh, with a um, with a backing gate a, a question someone said have you considered robots um no um i'm a believer that robots 
um, you should have a system designed around your robots, trying to fit robots into an existing system. Um, and um, um, we, we don't we don't feed in the parlor. We haven't got out of parlor feeders. Um, with our diet, I'm not. I don't want to feed um, a lot of cow cake. So I, that's that, that's my main reason for for not for not putting in robots. That's amazing. Thank you. And I guess we can ask here about um, you've got three times a day milking. When did you move yeah. to that? And, and how's yeah, that improved? Yeah, so, so, uh, three times a day milking. We um, we we started at eight years ago, um, and it's it, it made a massive difference to, to to all aspects. I mean, it's just funny, you know, that that first day when you're three times a day milking, you mil uh, our milking times were set in stone. You know, half past five, half past three every day. You know, never changed. And so to all of a sudden start, you know, start. Um, we, so we moved to five o'clock in the morning, one in the afternoon, and uh, eight o'clock at night. So, um, but as I, as I mentioned before, we took on two guys to cover that third um, to that e evening milking. Um, so for 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 myself and the existing staff. Um, especially at weekends, being able to be finished by four o'clock in the afternoon was, oh, was brilliant. You know, we, b before we weren't getting finished till half past six. And um, so that, that made a massive difference. And, uh, and then we, we did see a 15% lift in, in the yields. Um, and, you know, I'm a big believer it, it's better for the cows, um, really is. Thank you. Do keep your questions coming in if you, if you have any. Um, so lastly, investment in the wind turbines. So we can ask you a little bit about the environment here and what efficiencies. Yeah. Um, so yeah, the wind turbine went in in 2012. Um, it was um, it did just something that really um, that, that appealed appealed to us um, to, to myself and my parents, um, and it was it was a huge investment um because uh, we are we are tenants we don't own any land um i have a very good relationship with my landlord um at the time it was going to be a joint um, um a joint investment between us but when it came to putting the turbine up my um, landlord's father had recently died he had got inland revenue all over him um with debt duties and he said he didn't want any part of it but he was happy for us to go ahead with it and um yeah so it was uh, we're very fortunate being able to get the um to, to get a bank loan an unsecured bank loan for it because it was during the credit crunch um but yeah um it's it, it it's it's been great um it we just worked out actually that it's saving us um so um saving us about 13 grand a month um in, in electric um and uh, um and obviously we got on the good feeding tariff as well so it yields us um yeah it's around the third um on the just on the feeding tariff around the 35 to 40 grand a year um and we should finish paying the bank loan um of it in two years time so it, and it's it just does its thing you, you i wouldn't say you forget it's there but you never have to do anything with it so it's um apart from service it so that's yeah, great really yeah that's great and any other carbon efficiencies you're you're working towards or um well as as part as as, as um with being an isla farmer i mean our carbon footprint is very important and looking to reduce that carbon footprint all the time um so um yeah we've 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 got a um a biomass boiler which heats a farmhouse which we get the renewable heat initiative off that um we've uh, recently bought an electric car as well which is <laughs> we, 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 uh, we really like but um the biggest um the biggest um reduction to our carbon footprint would be if we can get our heifers carving at 22 months that that will make a that will make a huge difference that's great thank you we'll um I know we, we haven't got too much time left, so we'll go on to to feeding um, and, and nutrition. So if you'd like to start really with your homegrown forages and what you grow and what area. Yeah, um, so yeah, we've, we're, we're, we're 400 acres. Um, last year, um, um, last year was, was we, we didn't grow any cereals. It was all down to, to, to grass and maize. Um, 
so we, we, we don't have to um, rent rent in um, to to, um, to to buy in any acres to, to grow grass and maize maize on um, grass we do the um, we, we look to do multi cut from, um, from from perennial lays um, we got five five cuts in last year um, all of um, all, all very very even um, quality um, and um, and then we grew uh, 170 acres of maize uh, last year, um, which um, because of the year before um, when we were harvesting uh, we were harvesting and drilling maize on the same day this um, this spring. Um, so and uh, so last year with the weather was it was just a complete disaster for, for trying to get our maize in. And so we had all that maize ground, and so we looked to um, put maize in again um, to, uh, to just to increase our acreage. Um, it's done; it did really well, um, and we think it yielded around um, between um, 18 to 20 tons an acre. So they've had massive, um, ma massive maize crop in, which has enabled us to pull back on our. Um, the acres of maize we're going to grow next year and we've we actually put in 50 acres of wheat so it's um, it's enabled us to do that um but the but both but both the grass and the maize um chop length's really important it can't be too short so looking to uh, between five and eight mil and um, chop length when we're chopping maize that's that great yes yeah, going to ask so next so you do you're doing something a little bit different with compact feeding yeah. Would you like to start with a description of, of what yeah. it is and how you found yes. it? And what... Yeah, so so compact feeding, um, so it, it really came about when we, uh, the discussion group um, that I'm part of with, um, with um, the, the ASDA fund, we went on a study tour to Denmark and we, we found that a lot of the Danish farmers were using this um, system of um, and it's um, called compact feeding and um, it sort of goes against everything that we ever um, we ever thought about feeding cows before so um, I started to I started a version of compact feeding um, probably about two and a half years ago but only really got it um, got it properly um, in the past um, in the past sort of like um, 15 16 months so what compact feeding is is so start your um, your grass your forages chop really short um, you, you you can't really you can't have them too short then so into the feeder um, we put in the um, all the dry ingredients into the feeder then we add water um, so at the moment we're adding. Um, 12 kilos of water per cow into the feeder so a lot of water goes in there we mix that for um, 20 minutes and then we turn off the feeder then um, half an hour before we're due to feed again uh, due to feed to, to put the feed out we then add the grass and the maize so so add the forages in and then we mix it for half an hour so what effectively does is that the those dry ingredients in the water form like a, a mush, like a porridge-like consistency. Um, and so when you then add the, the grass and the maize and you mix it, that porridge coats all the fibers of the of the grass and maize. Um, so when you put the silage out, it's a very wet, dense, um, dense mix. And um, I think if we look to get it at as close we can to 39% dry matter. Um, so that goes out and then you, you, the first thing you notice is that the, when the cows are eating, they just take mouthfuls off the top. There's no sorting, rooting through the ration. They actually go to the trough, take huge mouthfuls of feed and then they, then they go and lie down. And all the studies that have been done Say that with a with a correctly um, with a correct compact feeding system, the cows will spend three to four hours a day extra lying down as opposed to a, 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 a non compact mix. Um, and, um, and and yeah, and also that if there's if there's feed left in front of the cows, when you put out the new when you go down with a feeder, a high percentage of the cows will stay lying down 
there is no difference between the feed coming out of the feeder to what's already in front of them um, because that they, they can't sort it. It's really interesting. Have you measured lying times or do you know what no. they are? No, no, I haven't, I haven't measured anything like that. But um, I, I, um, I like it and I think it works. Um, there's, I like it as well because in the summer, in hot days, you're putting out a cold wet mix for the cows and, um, and that, that can only encourage intakes. So it, it wouldn't spoil in the summer? You don't have to change no, your well, management? We, we, um, I think if you're feeding once a day, there, there can be issues on hot days with, with the ration heating up. But we, we feed twice a day and we, we, we don't see that. That's great. Thank you very much, Andrew. We'll, we'll go on to now your, uh, your key performance indicators. And I just want to say now, we do record all these webinars for YouTube. So if you are watching on YouTube, then you can ask questions by um, emailing the email in the description box. <laughs> just thought I'd say that. Um, so we'll start, Andrew. You completed these on the the KPI Express tool that we've got yep. on the website. Um, so we, there are there are more for all year round carvers, but we've just chosen three today to to go through. But Andrew will have all these KPIs on on the website soon for you to look at. So first, we've got age at first carving. You mentioned this; it was it's a little bit higher than you'd like yep. to. And what what would be your aim? In the yeah, next so, year or so. yeah, I mean, the, the aim is to get them, you know, get them close to carving at, um, at 22 months. Um, so uh, currently, um, we've the, the heifers in the in the new heifer building at, at around 11 months old. We look to get the activity collar on them then. So it's compiling data. And then as soon as they hit that um, 365 days, then we're looking to, to inseminate them, them from then on. But they are. They are well grown. Um, you know, we they they get off to a great start um, pre weaning, and we've just tried to keep that level of um, of, of gain going um, right right up to the point of uh, um, of the of them um, becoming pregnant. That's great. Look forward to seeing progress there. Then um, okay. next we've got total purchase feed costs. So at the moment, eight point two pence per litre. Yeah. What do you think gives you this figure? Um, well, it's, probably, it's it's a little bit higher than we like to be. It's normally um, like it to be, you know, to start with seven. Um, usually about, you know, it's about seven point eight um, around that level. Um, yeah, so um, we I, I buy ahead as much as I can um, to try to try try and secure a good price um, and. Uh, you know, I'm not one for for expensive feeds. I mean, you know, currently it's um, we feed it, feed it uh, feeding rolled barley, um, soda wheat, um, our own uh, crimp maize, um, and uh, trapid syrup. So all all you know, ch ch cheap ingredients, and just try and get that forage consistency of the diet up to. I think we're at um, 59. Um, yeah, we're about uh, yeah, 56% forage in the diet, but you know, we'd like to get that around around this 60% um, mark. And um, and why do you think it was higher in this this last year? Um, so last year, it, in that, that last year that we um, that there wasn't a maze there. Um, found it a very challenging year. We purchased a lot of um, a, a lot of maize. Um, and so, yeah, there's the, the, co the cost of that forage coming into the diet um, and yeah, and then just trying to, to feed other um, more, more of the bought in um, produce to, to account for that lack of um, lack of maize. Thank you. And then final, we've, finally, we've got one of the financials. So full economic cost of production. So we uh, yeah. Yeah, so um yeah this is uh yeah um just very um specific to 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 the last year um said we um built all the new new sheds um they, they they did go over budget 
and we purchased 100 extra animals and those 100 extra animals didn't come into the herd and uh, they didn't calve down until September. Um, so um, we only had three months of milk out of those um, that those animals, um, it wasn't like they calved in in January, which if they had done, I think it would have made the uh, full economic cost of production look a lot different. Yeah, no, it's, um, it's important to explain some of these figures. I can't just tell from what's on the page. Well, <laughs> yeah. thank you very much, Andrew. Um, I will now hand over to Nick Parsons. Um, so we might have time for a few more questions at the end, but we'll we'll see how we go. But thank you. Thank you, Emily. And uh, excellent introduction to the farm. I think uh, uh, really reflects Andy the uh, the attention to detail that you show. Uh, really interested. Great to hear that uh, kind of 90% of the cows not receiving uh, dry cow therapy at, uh, at drying off is brilliant. Uh, Angus sex semen is something different uh, and, and to aim for, for more bulls, which is again thinking ahead and thinking that kind of bigger picture. And uh, mobility scoring uh, every other week as well uh, can only help with regards to identifying those cows for the uh, for the uh, uh, foot trim. So yeah, brilliant. Right, I will crack on with my piece. And uh, if uh, I can just touch on to start with the fact that uh, HDB have been uh, working, trying to uh, pull together the new strategy and uh, the consultation uh, document has been launched yesterday. So I just wanted to touch on that. Thanks, Emily, if you want to uh, flick through for the next slide. So there's two areas uh, to, the, to the new strategy and the next, if I may. So the uh, strategy will cover the next five years. And uh, so we want to get feedback on this uh, prior to it uh, being uh, finalized and, and looking forward from April uh, next year. So the two areas we've been concentrating on is looking at uh, the way that Nicholas Sapphire has come in and, and wants to drive that change and uh, focus on cost savings and driving, driving through HDB uh, the uh, uh, efficiencies and uh, return for your uh, your levies. And uh, some of the areas uh, will modernise the way that they're going to uh, collect a levy. That's not so relevant for uh, for dairy at the moment. The way the processors collect currently uh, the levy, but other sectors will uh, will also look to that. And the five-year ballot that's been promised across HDB uh, to uh, to levy payers uh, on that. But the strategic uh, review and the, the piece that we'd like to encourage uh, uh, encourage uh, uh, replies and, and feedback on is around trying to uh, drive that improving performance and profitability and that uh, area very much reflects what we're talking around with strategic farms. Uh, flying the flag and recognizing that uh, both at home and overseas we need to drive markets for our produce and, and across the sectors. And then uh, what we're known for, I guess, is the evidence and the data that people use day to day and uh, continuing that research and continuing to uh, provide you uh, with, as levy payers, with information that you can use. Thanks, Emily. So in the dairy sector and the, uh, the consultation document is broken down into a number of areas uh, against each sector. Uh, within dairy, uh, recognising that we want to uh, look to provide tools, and I'll touch on one of the new tools at the, in a moment or two, but helping to uh, not only in, uh, it drive productivity, but also around uh, the environmental, in, uh, in, environmental impact that Andy was talking about earlier. Focusing on that research again around the environment, but also around genetics and animal health. The influence um, and uh, uh, push of, of strategic farms that we're driving and, and Andy's now the 20th strategic farm we've launched and uh, we continue to look to do that uh, going forward and then just continuing to uh, work on uh, work on that work around the uh, attitudes to dairy of consumers and really focusing on the work that we've done around milky moments, uh, the consumer facing work that's coming up as well as uh, the work that we did around uh, uh, the Department of Dairy Related Scrumptious Affairs that uh, had run the last, uh, last three years. So feedback wise, 
Uh, these are the ways uh, on the 7th of January, we've got a town hall virtual meeting that you can register for, uh, which will uh, give you the opportunity to uh, hear from uh, Paul Flanagan, the uh, sector director, and also uh, Richard, uh, the uh, current uh, board chairman, as well as uh, the opportunity to give feedback. And, and if you want to scribble these down, if you're looking or uh, wanting to see it again, it will be in the notes that uh, come out by email, or if you're watching it on YouTube, uh, if you look below, uh, ideally subscribe to the HDB channel, we'll, uh, we'll notify you of up, upcoming events, but also below that there will be uh, uh, the chance to uh, uh, pick up on these emails and online uh, feedback sessions. Thank you. So just uh, flick one more, thanks Emily. And uh, this is uh, just a real plea to uh, use the website to uh, follow Andy and follow the other farms, whether you're an all year round carver or a block carver, there are farms that will suit your system and uh, you'll be able to identify with. We'd encourage you to uh, engage with the website and be able to follow the stories, be able to see previous events and uh, activity that's coming up on each of the individual farms and then be able to uh, follow that journey. While we are uh, having to uh, deliver digitally the uh, launches and the, the technical meetings at the moment, we hope next year to uh, get back to uh, physical meetings. And I'm sure Andy will be delighted to welcome people to, uh, to the farm again and be able to get that two-way feedback. Although we've had a significant number of questions today, there's nothing like a uh, on-farm meeting as well. We'll continue to do in uh, in both ways and have that uh, digital background to it as well as uh, those physical meetings. Thanks, Emily. So I'm just going to rattle through a couple more slides, which is around the uh, KPI Express tool. So we delivered optimal dairy systems, which helps you identify yourself as an all year round carving uh, farm or block carving and has those KPI definitions that you can refer to now. It's picking out three here, but there are nine to each of the uh, uh, each of the different systems, and you can uh, compare yourself and identify against uh, the industry how they sit. So the KPI Express tool has been uh, developed and was launched in September. It gives you that opportunity to compare yourself to uh, industry targets. Uh, simply uh, register a couple of details, two minutes, and you're in and then you can either bring your own KPI to measure yourself against, uh, against that industry target, or you can uh, put your figures in, the data in itself, the raw data, and it will calculate where you sit uh, on that uh, KPI line. And this is an example of where uh, cats and heifers carved in the first six weeks. You'll be able to look, uh, see where you sit, see how you sit against the range of uh, the bottom, below average, right the way through to excellent. But also importantly, you can look at that center box. It gives you opportunities to uh, help you improve, to take you to information that HDB have created or other organizations that we can show you uh, different films, we can show you data, we can show you uh, and, and support you in that journey of trying to improve that, uh, improve that KPI. Now you can go in and do one KPI, or you can look to bring more data along and put all nine in. But I think the key is that uh, this benchmarking uh, against likes of Andy and the other uh, on the website, each of the uh, strategic farms have their own KPIs and uh, the industry figures against them. So it shows you how you can, uh, how you sit at the moment, but also where you potentially can improve. And I think as a dairy industry, we need to continue to drive efficiency, drive uh, a focus on, on uh, profitability and uh, productivity with regards to the way that we, uh, we work. So I'd encourage you, if you haven't had a chance to go and have a look, Go and have a look and uh, compare. Start comparing yourself against the uh, the targets in there. Thank you, Emily. Thanks for that, Nick. Um, and I guess that leaves me to say I think we're really out of time now. So thank you very much, Andrew, for today. Um, 
a few areas to focus on in future meetings so as Nick said please do engage with the website and keep up to date if you're watching this on YouTube um, do do like and subscribe and, um, and email any questions um, to the email in the description and if you're watching live now um, we really would emphasize to the fact that we'd like your feedback and it would be really interesting for Andrew to to hear what you think of his system um, and, and share your views. So, so please do email me and that will get back to Andrew. And if we haven't covered your question today, we will um, endeavour to, to email you and, and get an answer out. Um, so thank you very much, Andrew. Any, any final words? Uh, no, no, yeah, just please, um, any, um, any questions or, or thoughts then, uh, yeah, let, let us know. That's fantastic. Well, um, we will leave it there. So thank you very much, everyone. Um, have a good afternoon. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Well, that's good. Thank you and goodbye, everyone.